Hello there! In this tutorial, we are going to be creating this snake game in Python with the Pygame module. And this is intended for absolute beginners, so you don't have to know anything about the Pygame module. Although you do have to know the basics of Python programming in general, at least a little bit. And I will go through these steps to create the entire game. And if you already know the basics of Pygame, skip ahead to this step, then you go straight to the snake game. But for everybody else, just continue watching and we're going to talk about how games work in general. That is going to be really useful to understand what we are doing a little bit later on in this video. So let's talk about how games work. And I think this is best done by using an example. So here's an image from the first level of Super Mario World. And this image is composed out of several elements. We start with the background, then we add a floor and some bushes, then Mario himself, and finally some indicators at the top. And each of these elements is just a picture that you could even download and use yourself. And the important thing to note here is that this image is not just drawn once. Instead, it is drawn multiple times per second in what is called a game loop. And then, to turn this into a game, we have to add two more things. Number one is player input, so that you have to know what the player wants to do. And number two is that on each cycle, you also reposition where elements are supposed to be drawn. So in total, there are three steps. We check for player input, we position elements on the screen, and then we draw all of these elements. And if that happens often enough, you get a video game. So let's look how this would work in practice. So we first want to check for the player input. And let's say the player is pressing the button to the right. And as a consequence, we want to move Mario 5 pixels to the right. And after that, we draw the entire image, with Mario being 5 pixels further to the right. And all of this would happen in one cycle of the game loop. And on the next cycle, we do the same thing again. So if the player keeps on pressing right, we still keep on moving Mario to the right and redraw the entire thing again. And then we keep on redoing this about 60 times per second. And as a consequence, the player is perceiving all of this as an interactive medium. And in an actual game, much more is happening than just moving a player to the right. So for example, for Mario, if he is moving to the right, we also want to play a walking animation which further adds to the illusion that Mario is walking instead of just being repositioned on the screen. But we could also move around enemies, or we could give the player power-ups, or we could add some coins or timers, or really anything that would constitute parts of a game. And if you understand that logic, you can make a game in basically anything, as long as you can get these three elements. And this could even be a game in Microsoft Excel, this would also be possible. But in our case, we will use Pygame, so let's have a look at that. But Pygame is an external module, so you do have to install it from an external source. But that is quite easy if you use pip, either in the PowerShell or in a terminal. In both cases, all you have to do is type pip install Pygame and you should be good to go. Although there's one minor complication, that if you have Pygame 3.9, so the latest version that came out a couple of weeks ago, the main version of Pygame right now does not work because it wasn't updated yet. But that isn't really a problem, because there's a newer version of Pygame that isn't fully released yet. But for our purposes, it is perfectly sufficient. So if you have the very latest version of Pygame, all you have to do is type pip install pygame equals equals 2.0.0.dev22. And then you should be good to go, there's no other change you have to make. And with that, let's start writing some code. Here we are in an empty sheet of code. But for now, the very first thing we have to do is to import Pygame. Which should make sense that if you want to use Pygame, you have to import it. And in here, if I execute the code, if you're getting this message, then the import worked well. And along with that, we get a hello from the Pygame community message, along with a link to the website. But nothing that's really relevant here. So let me close all of that. So now we have imported Pygame and we can use it. But by itself, nothing happened yet. And to make something happen, we have to add a couple more things. The very first thing is pygame.init. And this line is quite simple, but really important. It effectively starts the entirety of Pygame. So Pygame consists of several modules. Let's say one module for the sound, another module for the graphics. And all of these have to be started. And much later in this tutorial, we are going to work a little bit more with pygame.init. But for now, this is the one line we need to start Pygame. But if we run the code now, we still can't see anything, except the welcome message. And to actually see something, we have to create what's called a display surface. And the display surface is basically what the player sees in the end. 
so you might call this the main game window. And this also has to be stored in a variable. And this is usually called screen. And how we create a display service is with pygame.display.setMode. It's a slightly weird name, but well, it is what it is. And in here, we have to add a tuple with our width and the height of the window we want to get. And let's say in my case, I want to go with 400 times 500. So our window is going to be 400 pixels wide and 500 pixels high. And if I run this code, you are going to see something really briefly. So let me run it. And there we could see a window for a very short period of time. And this is by design. So right now, Pygame knows that it's supposed to display a window, but it doesn't know for how long to maintain this window. And because of that, it creates the window and then closes it immediately afterwards. And to keep it open, we have to create our main game loop. And this is just a plain while loop. And this while loop, we are going to close from the inside. So this can just be set to while true. So this while loop by itself, unless we stop it from the inside, is never going to stop. And now in this while loop, we need to have one line that is called pygame.display.update. And what this basically does, and let me add a bit of white space, is that let's say in this while loop, we are going to draw all our elements. So for example, for snake, we're going to draw our background, we're going to draw the snake, we're going to draw a couple of fruits. All of this is going to be drawn in here. And then what pygame.display does is that it takes all of this information and displays it on the main display surface so that the player can see it. So this is the very minimum you need to display anything. And if I run the code now, this would be working, but I would not recommend to run it right now for the simple reason that we wouldn't be able to close it because we didn't implement this functionality just yet. And to implement that, we need what is called an event loop. And an event loop is, well, it's a loop that looks for different events. And each event could be something different. But most of the time, an event is some kind of user input. So this could, for example, be you pressing a button, like left or right or up or down on your keyboard. It could also be a mouse movement or us closing the window by pressing the little X on the top right. It could also be something else, like a timer, for example. We are actually going to see this later on. But let's go through this step by step. And the very first thing I want to check is if we are going to press the little X at the top of the window. So I have to create a very basic event loop. And this is just a for loop. So I want to check for event in pygame.event.get. So at the start of every loop of our game, we are going to check for every possible event. And then we can do something with these events. And what we have to look for is event.type. And this is going to tell us what kind of event we have. And this has to be an if statement. So if a certain event type is equal to something, we want to do something else. And the thing we want to look for right now is pygame.quit. And this event type is closing the window by pressing the X button. And if that is the case, I want pygame.quit. And this, for all practical purposes, is the opposite of pygame.init. But by itself, sometimes this can cause some complications. That some other parts of the program might still be running, so this usually is not enough. We want another line of code. And what we want is sys.exit. And sys is another Python module, so we have to import it. So at the top of our code, I import pygame and sys. And sys is a fairly straightforward module. It gives you access to lots of system functionality. And what sys.exit does is it basically ends any kind of code that it's being run on. So in our case, if we run sys.exit, we make sure our code is definitely closed. So with these two lines, we make very much sure that our game is going to be closed. With that being covered, let's try to run our code now and let's see what happens. And there we go. We have a window that is 400 pixels wide and 500 pixels high. And right now it's all black for the simple reason that we haven't drawn anything yet. But that we're going to cover in just a second. But for now, we are able to create a basic Pygame window. So that's a good start. But there's one more thing that's important for the basic setup. And let me explain what this is. Right now, our game loop, so our while true loop, 
is going to run as fast as our computer allows it to run. So for a really slow computer, it might run 10 times per second. But for a really fast computer, it might run 10,000 times per second. And this could be a problem, because on different computers, the game speed might be completely different because of this difference. So we have to make sure that our game runs at least somewhat consistently. And even on the same computer, it might run differently depending on how busy our scene is going to be. So we want to make sure that our game doesn't run faster than a certain maximum frame rate. And for that, we have to create a clock object. And all that a clock object does is that it limits how fast our while loop is going to run. And it's ultimately quite a simple thing to achieve. So let's go right back into our code and let's implement this. So below our screen variable, I'm going to create a new variable that I call clock. And this is going to create a clock object by typing pygame.time.clock. Spelling it properly. And here, do make sure the first letter is capitalized. That is important. But besides that, this is all we have to do. So this is a clock object that can help us influence time in Pygame. But all I want to do is right at the end of our game loop, I want clock.tick. And in here, we effectively have to pass in the frame rate. So how many times this while loop can run per second? And in my case, I am going to go with 60, which is usually a good middle ground for games. But you could make this a much larger number if you really wanted to. And with this, our game is never going to run faster than 60 frames per second. Or in other words, this while loop is never going to execute more than 60 times per second. Which makes our game quite a bit more consistent. Now there's still the other possibility that our game might run too slow. And this is something we don't have a simple solution for. This is basically game design, that you have to make sure that your game never runs too slow. And you're doing that by not having too many elements on the screen, for example. But in our case, since our game is so incredibly simple, this is not going to be an issue. But, alright. With that covered, we have a very basic window that runs at a maximum of 60 frames per second. So, this is a pretty good start. And now let's talk about how to add basic visuals to this. To really understand Pygame, you have to understand two basic elements. They are called surfaces and rectangles. And let's start with surfaces. And here's something slightly confusing. Earlier in this tutorial, we created a display surface. And this is different to a regular surface, although not that much. And let me explain it like this. Our display surface is the big canvas that our entire game is going to run on. And there can only be a single display surface. And the display surface is also displayed by default. For the simple reason that if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have a game. Now, a regular surface does the same thing. It is still a layer that we can put stuff on. But we can have as many surfaces as we like, and each surface is only displayed if we write code for that. So you could have quite a few different surfaces. If you didn't write code to display them, they would be invisible. So if you want to use a surface, you need to follow two steps. You first have to create a surface, and then you have to put the surface on the screen. And creating a surface can be done in three basic ways. If you import an image, you are going to create a new surface with the image on it. The same is going to happen with text. So if you create any kind of text, the text is always going to be on a new surface. And number three is that you could just create an empty surface that doesn't have anything on it. So it would just be black by default. Although you could also fill it with any color you want. And for the second step, you have to take the surface and put it on the target surface where you want it to be. In our case, this is always going to be our display surface. Although you could also put one surface on any other surface as well. But that's quite a bit of talk. Let's actually play around with this. So here I'm back in my code. And for now, I just want to create a basic test surface. And this is going to be just an empty surface. And how to create this is pygame.surface. And this kind of like set mode is going to need a tuple with a width and a height. And let's make this, let's say 100 pixels by 200 pixels. And that is all we needed. So now we have another surface. But if I run the code now, we wouldn't be able to see it because we didn't put it on the display surface. And this we have to do in our while loop. And what I want to do is to put our test surface on our screen display surface. 
And for that, we first have to type screen to get our display surface and then blit, which stands for block image transfer. And then here we need the surface and a tuple with the X and the Y position. So our surface is going to be our test surface. And for X, let's go with 200. And for Y, let's go with 250. So hypothetically, we should see something right now. So let's try it. And our code is running, but we still can't see it. Oh, well, technically we can, but it doesn't help us too much for the simple reason that both our screen and our test surface are both black. So technically, while they are both visible, we can't see them because they have the exact same color. So we have to figure out how to add color to each of them. And the easiest way to give them color is to use the fill command. And let's do this actually on the screen itself. So let me add another line of code. And I want to fill the screen with a greenish color. And for that, we need screen.fill. And in here, we need some kind of color argument. And there are two ways of achieving this in Pygame. Number one is an RGB tuple, and number two is a color object. The color object is easier to explain. You just type pygame.color and insert a string of a name of a color. And then Pygame picks a specific color that was predefined. So for example, I could type in here pygame.color and let's go with gold. And now if I run this, we should see a golden background color. And there we go. And now we can also see our test surface. And here, think about the starting position. This one is going to become a bit more important in a second. But for now, we have a basic color. But in my case, I don't want a predefined color. Instead, I want to define my own color to keep the entire thing consistent in tone. And to create a custom color, we need what is called an RGB tuple. So let me explain what that is. RGB stands for red, green, and blue. It's literally that simple. And what we basically do is we determine the amount of color for each of these values. So for example, we could have 100% red, 0% green, and 0% blue. And if we then put these colors together, we have a red color. And that's really all it is. The only thing you really have to remember is that the lowest value you can give for each color is zero and the highest 255, with 255 being 100% of this color. So in my case, I'm going to go with an RGB tuple of 175, 215, and 70. So our color is going to have quite a bit of green, a bit less red, and very little blue. And this combined is going to give us a greenish color. So let's actually implement this. So here I'm back in my code. And let me get rid of the color object. And I want to create an RGB tuple. So I create another list. And then here I type 175, 215, and 70. And now let's try this. And there we go. Now we have a greenish background. And if you want to challenge yourself and code along, here is going to be a short exercise. Try to get this test surface and fill it with a blue color. And if you want to do it, pause the video now and try to do it yourself. So this could be done before the while loop, and I just want to get test surface dot fill. And in here, to get a blue color, we could either go with pygame dot color, and in here type blue. And if I run the code now, our test surface is going to be blue. Alternatively, I could just add an RGB tuple that has zero red, zero green, and 255 of blue. And if I run this code, we have the exact same outcome. And with that, we have already covered the very basic colors. But here's one thing I really want you guys to pay attention to. That our test surface, we have placed on position 200 and 250. And this point is exactly halfway of our display. So the point we placed it on is right in the middle of the screen. But our test surface is very much not in the middle of the screen. So what's the problem here? And it's not really a problem, it's just how Pygame works. When we specify this point, we specify the top left of this surface. So of our rectangle, the top left point is going to be at position 200 and 250. And we are going to get more control over this in just a bit. But before that, I do want to cover an animation, just to cover it on a basic level. 
Right now, it looks like our surface is being static. And well, it kind of is. But the main principle here is that this image is being redrawn every time this while loop is running. And the reason it is static is because the position we put it on is always the same. But we could totally change it. So let me close it. And let's say I want to move the X position. So this one. And for that, I can just add a variable in here and create the variable early on. So let's call this xpos, and by default it is 200. So exactly what we had so far. So let me run it, and we get the exact same result. But what we can do now is just to add xpos plus equal 1. And now let's run the code again and see what happens. And there you can see our surface is going to move slightly to the right. And this looks like an animation, but basically what happens is that Every time this while loop is running, it is going to put the surface on this X position. But this X position gets slightly larger every time we call it. And because this happens at such small increments and so often, that to us it looks like a fluid movement. So we consider this an animation. And we could also do it the other way. So with minus, and now let's try it again. Now our surface is moving the other way, so it's going to the left. And with that, we have really basic animations. But there's one thing that is important to keep track of. And let me change this back to 200. And now I want to move the Y position. And let me just put an X position in here. Not great naming, but it really doesn't matter. And now I want you guys to make a guess. Is this surface going to move upwards or downwards? And what we basically do is make the X position smaller. So this one starts at 200, then becomes 199, then 198, and so on. And let's actually run this and see what happens. And here you can see, even though our X is getting smaller, our surface is moving upwards, which can be quite confusing, but let me explain what this means. The origin of our display surface is in the top left. So if you want to go to the right, you have to increase X, and if you want to go to the left, you have to decrease X. This part should feel quite natural. However, if you want to go downwards, you have to increase Y, and if you want to go up, you have to decrease Y. Which is the part that can get quite confusing. Although this is also the part that is really common in video game development. And this is going to take you some time to get used to, but ultimately it's not that bad. And let me close this. And let's do the opposite. So I want to increase Y, and, and now our test surface is moving downwards. So this is one thing that can get quite confusing. But all right, let me get rid of these variables because we don't want to go for animations anymore. So I just want to place this thing back at position 200 and 250. And let me run again, and this is still working. And now here's one thing that I talked a tiny bit about earlier, that we don't really have all that much control about how to place this surface. So for example, if we wanted to place the center of the surface, we couldn't really do it. Or let's say if we wanted to place the bottom right, we just couldn't really do it. And to fix that, Pygame has another concept that is called a rectangle or rect in short. And let's talk about those. And incidentally, they are also the second part on how to draw something in Pygame. And well, a rect is just a rectangle that you can either put around something else or use for drawing. And this rectangle has lots of different points that we can influence. And you can see all of them on the screen right now. And these points are super useful, not just for moving something, but also to measure if two objects are overlapping, for example, or if something is moved outside of the screen. Or you could also measure how large an object is. And there are two ways to create a rectangle. You could either create one by itself, or you could take an existing surface and create a rectangle around it. And then once you have a rectangle, you can do quite a few different things with them. But let's actually play around with this in code. So here we are back in our code. And the very first thing I want to do is to create a new rectangle. And let's call this test rectangle. And this is just going to be pygame.rect. And in here, we have to pass in four different pieces of information. We need an X position, a Y position, a width, and a height. And let's put this thing at position 100, let's say 200, and let's give it a width and a height of, let's say 100 each. And here again, this X and Y is still going to be the top left. 
but we are going to get more flexible in this in just a second. So now we have a rectangle, but if we run the code, we are not going to be able to see it. So this isn't going to do all that much. But what I could be doing now is use pygame.draw.rect and draw this rectangle. And in here, I have to pass in three pieces of information. I need the surface to draw on, I need a color, and I need a rectangle. So our rectangle is going to be our test rect, our surface is going to be our screen, and for the color, let's go with pygame.color, and I want to go with, we haven't used red yet, let's go with that. And now let's try this. And there we go, we have another rectangle. And this one is not a new surface, it's a different kind of object. And later on, when we create our snake, we are going to be drawing lots of different rectangles that we are going to each put on the screen. And you might be asking yourself, what's the really big difference between creating a new surface and putting that on the screen, or creating a rectangle and drawing that? And well, it depends on what kind of job you want to do. Usually, drawing a rectangle is a much simpler task, so it takes less code and less processing power. And most of the time for a surface, you don't just fill the surface, you add something else to it. So that just filling a surface and putting it on the screen doesn't really happen. If you want to do that, you would just use a rectangle. And there are quite a few different things we could draw. This could also, for example, be an ellipse. And now if we run this, we get a circle. And there are quite a few different shapes you could be drawing. But I don't want to draw anything just yet. And I also don't want to create a surface like that just yet. Instead, what I want to do is to get this test surface and use that to create a rectangle. And for that, we need test surface dot get rect. And what this one is doing is it gets this surface and it puts a rectangle around it. But the really useful thing now is that in the parentheses, we can specify on what point we want to place it on. So for example, I could type center and now in here, add an X and a Y position. So for example, now if I add in here 200 and 250, this rectangle would be placed right in the center of the screen. And then when I use blit for original test surface, I could use this rectangle to actually place the surface. So let me remove those two points and insert test rect. And now if we run this, we get our surface right in the middle of the screen. And there is quite a few different things going on right now. So let me go through them one by one in terms of what I have just done. I have first created a new surface called test surface. And this surface is 100 pixels wide and 200 pixels high. Then I have drawn a rectangle around this surface. And I have placed this rectangle right in the middle of our screen. And then I have used this rectangle to actually place the test surface on the screen. And we could also use another point. For example, I could use top right, and then we'd be placing the top right. So now the top right corner is in the center of the screen. And this way you get a ton of control over how you place elements on the screen. And let's actually try to move this rectangle to move our surface. So I want to get our test rectangle, and I want to move the right position. And just add plus equals, let's say one. And let's try this now. And now again, we can see our surface moving to the right. And the important point here is that if we move any point on the rectangle, we are going to move all the points on the rectangle. So we could, for example, also move the left of the rectangle and we'll have the exact same result. So this one doesn't really matter. And all right, with that, we have covered the absolute basics of Pygame. That was quite a bit of material. So if you feel overwhelmed, don't worry too much because I will go very slowly through all of this while I actually create the game. So let me get rid of all of this material besides the screen.fill color. So now we are back to a very basic setup that's just a green background color and doesn't do anything else. And on that, we are going to create our snake game. But before we come to the actual code for the game, let's first talk about the logic on what we are going to do. And there are two main concepts you have to understand for the snake game to work. Number one is that we are effectively creating a grid on our display. But we are not really creating a grid, we are just simulating it. And instead what we are going to do is that every time we are moving, we can only move in certain increments. So let's say every time you move, you have to move by the amount of 40 pixels. And since you can only move by that amount, 
you are effectively moving in a grid. Although it's not really a grid, it just looks like one. And into this grid, we are going to put our snake. And that's going to be the second major concept. And effectively, our snake is going to be a list with different positions. And each of these positions is a block. And all we are going to do to move the snake is to update each of the block in a certain direction. And then we are drawing the block and that gives us a snake. Ultimately, it's actually a really simple logic. But I think there was a ton of material covered, let's actually start talking about the snake. Now that we have covered the basic logic of Pygame and also the logic to make the snake game work, we can actually start making our game. And I'm going to start setting up our board and placing one piece of fruit in there. And the reason for that is that the fruit works in almost the same way that the snake does. So the fruit is a really nice way to start with the board and see how we can place elements in there. Here we are in the code that we have set up earlier. And the first thing I want to do is to change the size of our window. So these two coordinates. Because right now they are fixed. But I want them to be a bit more flexible. And essentially what I want to achieve is that we have one variable with the number of cells and another variable with the size of each cell. And then those two numbers combined create the size of our screen. So that we always fill the entire screen regardless of how big the cells are or how many cells we have. And for that, I'm going to create two new variables. The first one is going to be cell size. And I've set this to 40. And then we need a cell number. And this one I've set to 20. And at least for now, you could change these numbers to whatever you want. It doesn't really matter until we add graphics to the entire game. But now for the dimension of the screen, I want the cell number multiplied by the cell size, both for the X and for the Y. So now when I run the screen, we are getting a screen that is 800 by 800 pixels wide or 40 times 20. So this seems to work quite well. And that's really all we need to set up the basics of our game. So with that covered, we can start creating our fruit. And this is going to be a class. Or well, it's going to be an object, but we have to create a class for that. It doesn't need to inherit anything. And when I initiate it, I only need self. And now I want to achieve a couple of things with this class. So let me just write it in the comments. Number one is that I want to create an X and Y position. So we can actually place it somewhere on the grid. And besides that, I also want to draw a square. So wherever this position is, I want to draw a square, which is going to be the fruit. And later on, we are going to add graphics to this, but for now, this isn't going to matter. So I want to create self.x, and let's say for now, this is going to be five. And then I want self.y, and let's go with four. So right now, these are fixed numbers. I am going to change them just a bit. And having these two numbers, along with a cell size, would actually be enough to already draw a rectangle. However, I'm going to put one step in between. But I'm going to store these two values inside of a vector 2D. And let me explain why. Throughout this entire tutorial, we are going to work very extensively with two-dimensional data. So we want to have a really efficient way to work and store two-dimensional data so that we can change an X and the Y coordinate really easily. And vectors are perfect for that. And to explain why, let me illustrate a difference compared to a list with two values. You can see a vector that has an X coordinate of five and a Y coordinate of four. And then a normal Python list with five and four. And right now, both of these express the exact same information. And the first advantage of vectors is that accessing the X and the Y is a bit clearer compared to a list. So if you want to access the X or the Y for a vector, we can just take the vector, place X afterwards, and then we get the X and the same for Y. And for a list, we would have to use indexing and just add square brackets and a zero or one. And while this is quite a minor advantage, it does make our code considerably more readable if we have more code. So this is a nice thing to have. But the really important thing that really helps us with vectors is vector math. And here's what this means. Let's say we have our list and we want to move this cell to the right. And moving something to the right just means increasing the X by the amount of one. So in the list, we would use indexing to get the X value and then just add one to it. And this would be a fairly straightforward operation. And don't get me wrong, we could use lists for the entire game. It would be doable, but also kind of annoying to work in. Because in vectors, doing this kind of thing is much easier. Because when we have a vector, 
we can just create another vector that has a value of 1 and 0. So this would be a movement to the right. And then we can just add this vector to the original vector. And if you add two vectors together, you get the sum of both of the x values and both of the y values. So if you wanted to move the vector to the right, we could just add a plus right vector and then we have moved it. We would not need to identify any specifics of the vector, we could just go straight ahead. And especially for the snake later on, this is going to be so much better to work with. But alright, I hope that makes sense and now let's actually implement it. So here we are back in our code and I want to add these two values inside of a vector. So I create a new attribute with self dot, let's call it position. And to create a vector 2D in Pygame, we need pygame.math.vector2. And in here we have to create an x and a y value, which we already have. We just created them. And this is terrible spelling, self and self. So we just place these two values inside of this vector. And then we have a two-dimensional vector. And there's one more change I do want to make. That I don't want to type pygame.math every single time, I just want to type vector2. So in the import, I'm going to type from pygame.math import vector2. And that way, I can just type vector2, which is going to save me so much writing. And with that, we have a really efficient way to store two-dimensional data that we later can use to draw a square. So that's quite nice. And with that covered, I want to create a new method that I call draw fruit. So this one is, well, it draws the fruit. And let me get rid of these two comments. All right, so what I want to do in here is first create a rectangle in the right position. And then I want to draw the rectangle. So let's work through them. The first one is to create a rectangle. And let's call this one fruit rect. And this one is just going to be a pygame rect object. And this one is going to need an x coordinate, a y coordinate, then we need a width and a height. So we need four different pieces of information. And two of them are super easy to get because width and height are just going to be our cell size. So I can literally just copy cell size and paste it in there. And then we are already halfway there. And then we have to figure out the X and the Y. And well, this is going to be for now this position. So what I want to get is self.pos. This would be the entire vector, but I only want to get the X position. So in this case, this would be five. And then I want to do the same thing for our Y position. So self.pos.y, which will get us this value, which is four. And that is literally all we need to create a basic rectangle. And now we can get to drawing it. And really all we have to do is type pygame.draw.rect, which draws a rectangle. And in here we need three different pieces of information. We need a surface to draw on, a color, and then a rectangle that we want to draw. And we already have most of this information. So our rectangle is just going to be the fruit rectangle we just created. And the surface we want to draw on is this screen surface, so our main display surface. So that is already getting us quite far ahead. Now we need to work on the color. And this is going to be an RGB tuple. And for that, the amount of red is going to be 126. The amount of green is 166. And the amount of blue is 114. And for now, this is just going to be a plain darkish green. It doesn't look particularly good, but later on we are going to replace it anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And all right, this is actually almost all we need. So let's actually create a basic fruit just to see how this would look like on our game. So I'm going to create a new object with the fruit class. And then in our main game loop, after screen.fill, I type fruit.draw our fruit so that we can actually see it on the game. And let's run this and see what happens. So now we can't see our green rectangle, but there are two problems. Number one is that the rectangle is way too far in the top left. So something went wrong when we placed it. And number two, if you look at the bottom of the screen, is that Python is giving us a warning about implicit conversion to integers using int. And both of these we can fix quite easy because they happen in the same line. 
in this line here. So let's work through them step by step. And the first one is the actual placing of this rectangle. So right now, for example, this self.post.x is 5. So when Pygame places it, it literally places it 5 pixels from the left. But we don't want to place it 5 pixels. Instead, we want to place it 5 times the cell size. And same for position.y. Right now, it's placed 4 pixels from the top. But instead, we want to place it 4 pixels multiplied by the cell size. So literally, all we have to do in here is to multiply this by cell size. And this is what I explained earlier, that we don't really create a grid. Instead, we move each object by one pixel and then multiply it by the cell size. And this creates the illusion of a grid. And this is really all we need. And let's try this. So this is looking so much better. And just to test, let me change both of these to zero so we can tell if they are in the top left. And there we go. Now we have our square in the top left. And just to make one more test, let's put it to 10. So now it should be on the left and roughly in the middle of the screen. And there we go. This seems to be working now. So now we actually have a basic grid that we can use to place elements on. And with that, we can also work on the second problem that we have an implicit conversion to integers. And what this basically means is that pygame.rect wants to have integers for all of its values. But getting values from a vector is always going to be a float, even if we pass integers into it. So right now, Python converts both of these into integers by itself. But this might be removed in a future version of Python. So to make sure our code is going to work in the future, we have to do this manually, which is super easy to do. All we have to do is to put the int method around it, and we're good to go. So let me do it for both of them. And now if we run it, we don't get an error message anymore. And all seems to be good. Cool. And really all the integer method does is it takes a value and turns it into an integer. That's really all that happens here. And before we finish this part, there's one more change I do want to make. That right now, both of these values are fixed. But we want them to be random. And to do that, we have to import another module. The random module, which can generate random numbers. And what we want is random.rand int, which generates a random integer from one value to another. And we always want to start at zero. And we want to go all the way to our cell number. So cell number. However, there's one more thing we do have to do. That rand int goes from this number all the way to this number. And it also includes this number. So this could be a number from zero to 20. And whenever we draw a rectangle, this position is going to be the top left. So there's a very small chance that the top left might be something like 0 and 800. And this would be outside of our window. So we have to subtract 1 from this. And this ensures that we are always on the screen. And since we have a square, we can just copy the entire thing for our y position. And with that done, let's try it a couple of times. So we have a random square here. Let me close it and let's try it again. We have a different position. And one more time, we have another different position. Cool. And for now, this is all we needed for the fruit. So I can close it. And we are going to make one more change later on to it. But for now, it's working as intended. And all right, now that we have covered the basics of the grid, we can actually start creating our snake. And the snake is going to work in a really similar way compared to the fruit. The only difference being that now we don't just draw one block on the screen, we draw multiple. But we are still going to use vectors. So effectively what we are going to do is we have a list with all the blocks in our snake and we cycle through this list and draw all of these blocks. So let's start with that and once we have that we can talk about moving the snake. So here we are back in our code and I want to create a new class that I call snake. And I'm going to initiate it as always. There's nothing special we need here. And for now I only want to have a single attribute that is going to be the body of our snake. And this is going to store all the vector twos that create our snake. And in here, we are going to place all the blocks that constitute our snake. And let me actually add some just to visualize this. So I want vector two and let's go with five and 10. So this is roughly in the middle. Then I want to have another vector and one more. Let's start with three. And I'm going to be 6. 
and seven. So this is just going to be three blocks right next to each other. And this is also what the player is going to see when the game is being started. So this would always be the starting position, but you could change it as much as you want. But all right, now we need a method that draws our snake. Does not need any parameters. And all I want to do in here is for block in self.body. So I'm going to cycle through all of these vectors. And I want to do something with each of them. And in here, very similar compared to our draw fruit, I want to create a rectangle from the position and then draw the rectangle. So this is going to be incredibly similar to our draw fruit method actually. So let's go through it step by step. And this could actually be an exercise if you want to challenge yourself. Try to cycle through this list and draw all of these vectors. And this should look incredibly similar compared to these two lines. So pause the video now if you want to go along and try this yourself. So the very first thing I want to do is to create a new rectangle. I call this one block rect. And what we need again is pygame.rect. And here we need an x, a y, a width, and a height. And again, the width and the height are super easy. It's again the cell size. So all I want is the cell size for the width and the cell size for the height. Now for the X, I want the block. So this block here, which right now, let's say for the first element would be the vector of five and 10. And since we're looking at the X, this is going to be X. So this is literally the same thing we have done here. And from there, we have to multiply this by our cell size. And then to avoid the warning by Python again, we have to put all of this into an integer statement. And that's basically it. So now I can copy the entire thing and place it in for the Y and then change block dot Y. And here, what you could be doing to make all of this a bit more readable is to create all of this on a few separate lines. So our X position would be all of this. And then I can copy it and create our Y position. And then in here, I could just write X position, Y position. So this would have the exact same outcome. Although I guess this one is quite a bit easier to read, but it's ultimately up to you. But okay, now we have a rectangle, we just have to draw it. So again, I want pygame.draw.rect. And in here, I still want our screen surface to draw on. And now I'm going to need a new color. And I went with 133, 191, and 122. And then for the rectangle, we just want our block rectangle. And with that, we have drawn all of these vectors. So now all we have to do is to create an object from this class. And then in our game loop, just call snake.drawSnake. snake. And let's see if this is going to work. And there we go, we have our basic snake. Although I think right now the color is a bit hard to see. So let me close it and go all the way back to our snake. And let's change the green value to 111. This is going to turn the entire thing quite a bit more red and let's try it now. And there we go, this is quite a bit easier to see. But ultimately it doesn't matter all that much because we are going to replace all of this with proper graphics later on. But I think for now this is a bit nicer to work with. But okay, now we have drawn all the basic things we need to make the game workable. But our snake doesn't move and let's work on that. Okay, so let's talk about how to move the snake. So here's the snake. And let's say we want to move this snake one field further to the right. To achieve that, we take the head and move it one block further to the right. Then we take the block before the head and move it to where the head used to be. And then we go through the entire snake and do this to every block. So that the position of every single block takes the position of the block that came before it. And that way every single block follows the head of our snake. And this is how we are going to move the snake. So we are not actually moving the snake. Instead, we are taking each of the block and putting them in different positions. And this simulates the illusion of movement. And here's how we are going to simulate this in our code. Besides our self.body list, we are going to add a self.direction. 
And this gives us the direction that the snake head is going to take in the next turn. And then in our game, at certain intervals, we take the first element of our self.body list, which is the head, and move it by the direction. And this way we're moving the head of the snake. And then we're going to create a new list that copies our entire self.body except for the last element. And to this new list, we are going to add our head. And that way we have moved every single item inside of the list one step further. And we also added a new item at the front for our head. So that's quite a bit of logic, so let's actually implement it. And there are two more things that we really need to make this work. Number one is that we need some player input so that we can control the snake. And number two is that we have to create a basic timer. And then we only want to move our snake whenever this timer triggers. And in my case, this is about every 150 milliseconds. So quite a few things to cover. And let's just start very simple and we only want to move our snake to the right. So here we are back in our code and I'm still working in my snake class. And what I want to do is to create a new method that I call move snake. It doesn't need any parameters. And in here we are going to move our snake. And the first thing I want to do is to create a copy of our body. And this I can just do with self.body and then using slicing. So right now this would copy our entire list. But we don't want to copy the entire thing, we only want to have the first two elements. So we are going to go from the first element to the one element before the last. So this list right now would only give us these two elements. So this element here at the end would just disappear, which is exactly what we want because we want to move the snake forward. And then to this list, I want to insert another element right at the beginning. And this is going to be our head that we are moving. So this has to be at index zero. So it's right at the start of the list. And the value it is going to have is the previously first item of our list plus a direction. And this direction we are going to create from player input. But for now, it is just going to be a vector two that points to the right. And let me just type it properly, vector two. Let's say for now it's just gonna be one and zero, so it moves to the right. So this is self.direction. And this is really all we need for the basics of our snake movement. So we copy the entire self.body list, but remove the last item. And then for the head, we're adding one more element right at the front. That is going to be the first element of the previous list, last the direction we want to go in. And that way, the entire snake is moving forward. Now for the last bit, all we have to do is self.body is our body copy. So that we are returning the entire list back to our body, because this is the one we are going to draw. And I don't want to change this entire thing again. And... Really, this is all we needed to move our snake in the most basic way. But here's the problem now. I don't want to execute this method all the time. I only want to execute it at certain intervals. In my case, every 150 milliseconds. So we need to create a timer. And timers in Pygame work within the event loop. So this part here. Because this event loop can look for different things. Right now, we only look for one specific event that we are closing the game. But there could be lots of other events. And in a bit, we are going to add more events for player input. But we could also add another event that is just a timer that triggers every few milliseconds. And this we are doing in two lines of code. The first one I'm going to call screen update, and this is going to be a variable that we don't want to change. And this one is a pygame.user event. And let me just type it properly. So this would be a custom event that we could trigger. And how we trigger it is by creating a timer. And to create a timer, we need pygame.time.setTimer. And in here, we need our event, so screen update, and then how often we want to trigger it. So in my case, 150. And this is in milliseconds. So this event is going to be triggered every 150 milliseconds. And then in the event loop, we can capture it. So if event dot type is equal to screen update, then we want to do something. And what I want to do is to get our snake and I call the method move snake. So snake dot move snake. And this is all we needed. So let's try this now. And there we go. We have a moving snake that moves to the right. 
Obviously right now we can't control it, so it's not particularly useful. But it is working. So with that covered, let's actually work on keyboard input. And this still happens in the event loop. So we can just keep on working in here. So again, if event.type, and this time we look for pygame.keyDown. So this is going to be triggered whenever we press any button on the keyboard. But we want to check for specific keys. So we have to look for if event.key is equal to, let's say in this case, pygame.kup. And this pygame.kup would be the up key on your keyboard. So when we press this, then we want to do something. And what we want to do is to get our snack again. And what I want to change is the direction. So right now, our direction is going to be 1 and 0. So we're moving to the right. But if I press up, this should be vector 2. And we don't want to move to the right. And we move up, so minus 1. So now if we run the game, we are still moving to the right. But if I press up, we start to move upwards. So this is working quite well. And now all we have to do is to copy this line a couple of times for each direction we want to go in. And this could actually be a really good exercise for you to understand vectors. So if you want to code along, pause the video now and try to add three more if statements for left, down and right. Let's do it together now. So I want to take this entire thing and just copy it a couple of times. And the first one, let's go with right. This one is going to be 1 and 0. Then let's go now with down. And down is just y equals 1. And then finally, we want to go to the left. And left is going to be minus 1 and 0. And that is pretty much it. So let's try the entire thing now. And let's see how this works. So we can still run around. And this is working really well. Obviously right now I can go over our fruit and nothing is going to happen. But this we are going to cover in the next part, which is going to come now actually. So now we have a snake that can be moved around and we have a fruit on the field. Now let's try to bring them together. And for that I'm going to create a third class that I called main. And this one is going to actually contain the logic of our code which is going to make it much easier to maintain where things are going to be. And I think this is best explained by implementing it straight away. So let's jump right into our code and let's implement it. So here we're back in our code and let me minimize the snake and the fruit so we have a bit more space. And I want to create another class that I called main. And when we initiate it, I want this main to have our snake and this is literally creating the snake object. And then also the same for our fruit. So that whenever we are creating an object from this class, we are also creating two more objects from these two classes here. So that the entire game can happen inside of this one class. And then this main class is going to have a couple of methods to maintain the game. The first one I called update. And what's going to happen in here is that we are moving the snake. So I copy this one from the event loop and place it in here. And I can also get rid of these two objects because we don't need them anymore. And instead for all of this, I'm going to create our main game. And this is going to get main. And then in the event update, I call main game dot update. So we don't actually change our game. But now, Whenever we call screen.update, so this event here, we are calling main game.update, and main game.update moves the snake. And there's one more change we have to make. This has to be self.snake. So we are targeting this one. So the snake itself remains unchanged, just how we trigger it is going to be slightly different. And then I'm also going to do the same for draw elements. So all the stuff that we want to draw is going to happen inside of this method. So right now, we draw our snake and our fruit in the main game loop. But I want both of these to be in here. So that all of this happens inside of our main class. So that in our actual game loop, we can just call main game dot draw 
elements. And this is quite a good practice that you want to keep this main game loop as clean as possible. But okay, let's actually try to see if this still works. And it does not, because name error snake is not defined when we are calling our directions. Because we have to change this one here to main game dot snake, and then it should be working. So let me copy all of these. And let's try it again now. And there we go. Nothing much changed so far. And you don't necessarily have to do this kind of step, but it is going to make it much easier to organize your game. Okay, so all of this is still working. And the really nice advantage we have right now is that both of the snake and the fruit are in the same class, so we can check where they are in relation to each other. So for example, if the head of our snake is on top of the fruit, we want to do something with the fruit and with the snake. And let's actually do that. So I'm going to create a new method that I called check collision. It's not actually a collision, they just happen to be on the same spot. And what I want to check in here is if self.fruit.position, so this vector here, if that is identical to self.snake.body and the first element. So this is going to be the head of our snake and this is our fruit position. And if they are in the same position, our snake is eating the fruit. So then we want to do certain things. And for now, let's just test if this is working. So I want to print snack. And let's try to run the code. And nothing is happening because I forgot to call this method. So in our update method, I want to call self.checkCollision. And now let's try this. And there we go. We can go over the fruit and we print a statement. So we know this if statement is working. So that's quite nice. And there are two things I want to do when our snake is colliding with the fruit. Number one is I want to reposition the fruit so that it's ending up in a new position. And then besides that, I want to add another block to the snake, which is the main point of the game, that you make the snake as long as possible. And let's start with the fruit. That one's the easier part. So I want to target our self.fruit and there I want to add a new method that I called randomize. So let's create this one. So let me close the main one for now. And all the randomize method has to do is to create new random numbers in here. So pretty much literally the same lines of code. So I can just copy all of them, create a new method that I call randomize and just copy these three lines of code because they create a random position and place the element there. And I can just call self.randomize. And that's all we needed to move the fruit. So let's try this. So it's still working and we get a new position for our fruit. And let's try it again. And there we go. This works really well. Last one, there we go. Cool. So this is the first part that we want to reposition our fruit. So this one's done. Now we come to the second part, adding another block to our snake. And this one is also actually super easy. So again, we want to target our snake. And I want to add a new method that is called add block. So let's create this method. So let me close main again and open snake. And now let's create add block. And now we have to think about what we are going to do. Cause doing this is actually super easy, but you do have to think about what you are going to do. And ultimately it goes back to these three lines of code. And specifically this line here, that right now we copy our self.body list and take every element except the last one so that we are moving the entire snake forwards. But if you want to add a block to the snake, all we have to do is to remove this one and take the entire body. And we are still going to add a new position at the front, so we are extending the snake. But this is really all we have to do for the change. So let me revert this back. 
And how I implemented this is I created a new attribute that is called self.newBlock. And by default, it is false. And what adblock does is it changes self.newBlock to true. And if self.newBlock is true, so in our move snake, if self.addBlock is true, so let's just type it in full, then I want to copy the entire block and not delete anything. And if that is not the case, I just want to move the entire snake without adding anything towards it. And that is pretty much it. So let's try it. And there's one more thing I do have to add. So... Oh, I realized there's a typo. This is an app block. This is new block if this one is true. So now let's try it. And now when we pick up something, our snake is going to extend for all eternity, which I guess is a little bit funny, but not the intended thing we want to achieve. And the reason why this happens is because this lock true stays true. So once we are colliding with a fruit, it is always going to extend, which we don't want. But we can fix it super easily by changing self.newBlock to false. And now let's try it again. So now our snake, every time we collect a fruit, is going to get a tiny bit longer. And this seems to be working really well. So this already is a really basic snake game. And well, takes no time at all to create it. And with that, we have our basic logic. But the problem right now is that our snake cannot die. So let's work on that. And there are two conditions that could lead our player to fail. Number one is that the snake hits itself or that the snake hits any of the screen walls. So effectively, we have to add two if statements. So let's start working on it. So here I'm back in my code and I want to work in our main class function. And I want to create a new method that I call check fail doesn't need any parameters and in here we want to check if snake is outside of the screen and check if snake hits itself and let's start with the first one that we want to check if the snake is outside of the screen and this is actually going to be super easy to check effectively all I want to do is if the snake is between zero and the number of our cells, so in this case, 20. And if that is not the case, then we want to go to the game over screen. And we only have to check this for the head of our snake because the rest of the body always follows the head. So only the head really matters when we check for game over. But let's implement this. So I want to check if not, zero is smaller or equal than our self.snake.body zero. And this is smaller or equal than cell number. So there's quite a few things going on right now. So let me talk through it. Self.snake.body is the body of our snake. And zero is going to be our head. So let me open it. Right now, this would be this element here at position five and 10. And we want to check if this is outside of the field. So if it is not between zero and the number of cells. And there's one thing I forgot. This one here is a vector, and we can't compare a vector to one single number. So we have to check this for x, so that we only check left and right. And we are going to add the top and the bottom in just a second. But for now, if that is the case, we want to do something. So let me create a new method that I call self.gameOver. So dev.gameOver. And at least for now, if our game is over, I just want to quit the entire thing. So I copy these two lines and paste them in here. But we are going to change this later on. In our update method, we actually have to call it. So self.check fail. So in theory right now, if our snake is too far to the left or too far to the right, it should fail. So let's try. And let's just go to the right and the game is over. But there's one bug right now, that this cell number 
at the highest point would be 20, but our cell furthest to the right is cell 19. So we could, in theory, go one field outside of the game, which I don't want. So I just removed the is equal to, and we have to be smaller than this number. So now, if I try this again, our snake or our game fails whenever we hit the right wall. So that's perfect. But now the problem is that this is only going to work for left and right. So we have to improve this if condition to also check for the top and the bottom of the screen. And this could again be your challenge. So pause the video now and try to do this yourself. So really all we have to do is to add an OR statement and copy the entire thing. And then change it to Y. So we are going to check if the head of our snake is not too far to the left or to the right, or if it's not too far up or down. And this is really all we have to do. So let's try all of this now. And let me try to go game over from the top of the screen. And this is working. Cool. So now we have the condition to check if the snake has hit any of the walls. So with that covered, we can check if it hit itself. And really what this means is we want to check if the head of the snake has collided with any other part of the snake. So I'm going to start by cycling through every single block of the snake except for the head. So for block in self.snake. And I only want to go from the element with the index 0 all the way to the end. So we don't take the entire snake, we only take all the elements that come after the head. And in here, I want to have an if statement. That if any of these blocks is equal to self.snake0. And if that is the case, we go back to game over. And this would be the proper logic. Although I did just realize I made a typo. This should be snake.body. And same for this one, snake.body. Because snake is the actual object we created and body is the actual part that contains all of the blocks. And while we added, I also realized I made another mistake. And let me go all the way to the top to explain what I did wrong. So when we are creating our snake, it is moving to the right. So the vector is one and zero. However, the problem now is that our snake is actually facing to the left, not to the right as I initially intended it. And you can see this quite easily, that the very first item is this point here, at position 5 and 10. So in theory, this should be the point furthest to the right, but it's not, because the second and the third item have greater x values. So this one is to the right of this one, and this one is to the right of both of these. Which basically means that the head of our snake is to the left of the body of the snake. And since we are moving the head of the snake to the right, it is going to move inside of itself. So we do have to fix this, and sorry about that. But there are two ways of fixing this, it's really easy to do. Number one, you could either move the head by default to negative one. So that we are moving the head of the snake to the left and all would be good. But I don't really like that because it's too close to the wall. And instead what we can do is change these two vectors to four and three on the x positions so that they are to the left of the head. And with that covered, let me go back down to our check fail logic. And let's try this. And the snake is still going to move. That seems to be working quite well. And let me pick up a couple of items so I can actually move into myself. And yeah, it seems to work. So cool, now we know this is going to work. And this is the basic check fail logic. However, there's one problem right now. Uh, let me run the game again. Now the snake is moving to the right and I could just destroy myself by clicking to the left. And the problem here is all of this code here, that we could always change direction, let's say going up, even if we are going down, so that we have to add some code here that our snake cannot reverse itself, because then we would instantly destroy ourselves. And this can very easily be done with just adding another if statement. So right now we check if event key is the up key. And now I want to check if main game dot snake dot direction dot y is different than one. And only if that is the case, we want to execute this line of code. And let me explain what this means. So when we're pressing the up key, we want to go up. However, if we are moving downwards, this is not supposed to work because then we would fail immediately. So we want to check if our current direction in the y direction, so this part here, is anything but one. 
because if it's one, we are moving downwards. So only if it's different from one, then we can actually do this line of code here. And this line of code, we just have to copy a couple of times and change it for the different directions. So for right, it would be x and minus one. So that if we are going to the right, we cannot currently go left. That just wouldn't make sense. We would just reverse immediately. Then for down, we would again look at y, but it would have to be minus one, minus one. And then finally, to go left, then we again have to look at x and we can only go to the left if our snake currently is not going in the right direction. And all right, this is basically all we need. So let's try it now. And now I'm moving to the left and I can't reverse direction. You can't really see it, but it does work. And we can still pick up all the other elements. So all of this is working. So nice. And I can still get game over from moving into a wall. So with that, we have created a really basic snake game. So this one is going really well, but it really doesn't look all that good. And also we can't tell a score. So this is the stuff we are going to start working on now. That we are going to start making this game a lot prettier. And this is going to involve quite a bit more code. But ultimately, it's a really good practice to learn how to use if statements and the enumerate method. But let's start with a really simple one, that I just want to display a proper fruit instead of just a rectangle. And let's jump right into the code. I think that's going to be the easiest way to approach this topic. So here we are back in our code. And the very first thing I want to do is to actually import an image of our apple. And I'm going to do this where I initiated all the other elements. And I want to import an apple. And to import an image, we need pygame.image.load. And then the file direction. And this has to be a string. And in my case, I have a folder called graphics. And in this folder, there's an image called apple.png. And here again, this is only going to work if your code is in the same folder as this graphics folder. So make sure you have them in the right place. And then also, I want to convert alpha this image so Pygame can work with it easier. So all that this method does is it takes this image here and it converts it to a format that Pygame can work with easier so our game can run better. But okay, this is all we needed for the apple. So now, when we have our fruit class, we can, instead of drawing a rectangle, we can draw an apple. So let me comment this line out because we don't need it anymore. But we are still going to need the rectangle, so keep that one. And really, all we have to do is to use screen.blit and now we need a surface and a rectangle. Our surface is going to be this apple here. That whenever we import an image into Pygame, it is going to be on its own surface. So we can just add apple in here. And after that, we need a rectangle or at least some kind of position. And we also have that. It's just this fruit rectangle. So I just type in fruit rect. And this is literally all we needed. It's surprisingly simple. So let's try it off this now and see if it works. And yeah, it does. We have an apple. And it still works with randomizing. And all of this works super well. And there we go. So this already covers our entire fruit class. Now I can close it and we never need to open it again. And with that part covered, we can actually put the graphics on for our snake. And this is going to be the most complex part of this entire tutorial. But in general terms, here's what we are going to do. We are going to go for every single block in our self.snake.body and look at how each block relates to the block before and after itself. And from this relation, we can tell what kind of block to put in this place. So effectively, we are going to create a really long if statement that checks a huge range of different factors. And I think this is really best explained while actually doing it. So here we are back in our code. And the very first thing I have to do is to actually import all the images we need for the snake. And this is going to look very similar compared to this apple import. Except now we are going to import quite a few more. And since we only need them for the snake itself, I'm going to do this in the snake class when we are initiating it. And in here, I already have all of the lines ready and let me paste them in. So this is quite a few different graphics that are being imported. We have all the possible head positions, all the possible tail positions, then a vertical and a horizontal body, and finally all the curved body parts. So in total, 14 different images. 
And these are all the possible graphics that could be used for our snake. And now that we have all the graphics, we just have to figure out where to put them in our game. And this is going to happen in our draw snake function. So let me close everything else. And let me give some space so we can focus on this part. And first of all, this part that we used to have, we don't need anymore. So I'm just going to comment it out. Actually, let me get rid of it entirely. So we need all the space we can get. And here, let me go through it really slowly. The first thing we want to do is we want to look at all the blocks in our snake body. So we want to look at for block in self dot body. But this by itself would not be enough because we want to look at more things. We don't just want to look at the block itself. We also want to look at the block that comes before and the block that comes after. And for that, we are going to need the enumerate method. And what enumerate does is that it gives us an index on what object we are inside of our list. So we have to type in index and then block. So index is the index we are on and block is the actual object that we are going to look at. So for example, in our body right now, we will get an index of zero and then vector two would be our block. And for the second entry, this would be index one and the block would be the vector. And this would allow us to access quite a few more blocks that are not the block itself. So this one is really useful. And in here, we have to do lots of different things now. And let me just write them out. So number one is we still need a rect for the positioning. So maybe I shouldn't have deleted the earlier one, but we can just write it again. So that doesn't matter too much. And once we have that, just to get started, we want to figure out um, what direction is the face heading. So in what way is our snake looking? And this is going to be quite a bit larger. So let's code until that point. So let me start by creating the rect again. And this again is the same thing we have seen earlier, where we literally just take the x and the y position from our block. And from that, we create a pygame.rect object and it has an X position, a Y position, and then we have cell size and cell size for the X and the Y size. So this is the same thing we have done earlier. And this we still need. This is what we use to actually place the image and get the position. So this was the easy part. Now we have to think about how can we identify different parts of the snake. So for example, how can we tell which part is a head and which part is a tail? And for that, the index is incredibly valuable because all we have to do is if index is equal to zero. Because index zero is always going to be the first element and our hat is always going to be our first element. So this is all we needed. So if that is the case, we want just like for the fruit screen dot split. And in here we have to enter a surface and a rectangle. We do have the rectangle. That's our block rect. And just to pick one of the heads, so we have four different heads for each direction. Let's start with head right. And if that is not the case, so else, at least for now, we just want to do the same thing we have done earlier. So pygame.draw.rect. And I want screen. And I forgot the color we had, so let's just go with 150, 100, and 100. And then log rect. So effectively what we are going to do is that we create a rectangle at the position where we need it. And if this rectangle is the first in our self body list, we are going to place the right facing head of our snake there. And if that's not the case, we just draw a plain rectangle. And let's actually try this. And I made a typo. It's enumerate. And now it gets blue. So this looks much better. So now let's try it again. And there we go. We have an incredibly weird looking graphic. But we do have a graphic of a snake hat that kind of works. So at least we're making some progress. Cool. That's a step in the right direction. So this line here is kind of working. But the problem we have right now that, let's put it number three, the snake hat direction is not updating. So what I want to achieve is that if we are moving upwards, the snake hat is also looking upwards. And we do have all the graphics to make this work. But we do have to figure out how to select the right image. 
And how I solve this is by putting all of the logic for this into its own method. So I have self update head graphics. And this is going to create a new self head attribute. And this is what we are going to use in the end. So this method here effectively picks one of these four, whichever is appropriate for the direction we are going. So let's create that one. So I go to dev, update, add graphics, and it needs self. And here's how this is going to work. We are going to take the head of our snake, so the first element in self.body, and subtract it from the item that comes right before it. And that way we get the relationship between the two. Or in more mathematical terms, we are going to subtract one vector from the other. And from the result, we are going to get how they relate with each other. So if one vector is above or below or to the left or to the right of the other. And here again, vectors are incredibly useful because we can just subtract from each other and understand how they relate to each other. But okay, I created a new variable that I called head relation. Terrible name, but I could not think of something better. And what I want to do is I want to go at self.body and get the second item, so the one with the index one. And let me just type it properly. And from that, I subtract our head, so self.body zero. So this is going to result in a new vector that could point in one of four directions. And from this direction, we're able to tell how the head relates to the block that comes before it. And really, all we have to do is if head relation is equal to vector two, and let's start with the first one, one and zero. So this would mean that those two combined end up with one and zero, which means that our head is to the left of the next block. So if that is the case, self.head is going to be self.head left. And since we have quite a few if statements, I am going to keep them on the same line just to make it a bit more readable. And now all we have to do is copy this thing a couple of times, change this to L if statements, and now update the different vectors. So the easiest part would be changing this to minus one. So then this one would be at dot right. Then if this is zero and this is one, so this would mean there's a block below the head of our snake. So our snake is looking up. And then for the final one, by the process of elimination, the snake has to be looking down. And that's basically it. So let's see if I get this right and let's try it now. And yeah, there we go. Our snake head is updating quite nicely. So this is quite a good start. Okay, so this would cover the head of our snake. So I can close this method and not look at it again. And now we come back to our if statement. And let me get rid of this part here because we fixed that bit. So now we have the head of our snake. Now the next easy bit or easy-ish bit is to get the tail end. So the last block that we want to cover. And this we can also address really easily because this part is always going to be the last one. So we can use L if index is equal to last item in self.body. So we have to figure out some code to get the last item in this self.body list. And well, all we need is the length of our self.body. So this is all the items in there. And then minus one, because we start counting from zero. And with that, we always get the last item. So if we have that, we can do the same thing we have done for the head. So screen.blit, and this time it's self.tail, and we still need our block rect. And self.tail does not exist yet. But we do have, if I open our init method again, we have all the different directions for the tail. So I am effectively going to copy the method we used for the head, this one, and create the same one for the tail. So let me close all of this and create self.update tail graphics. And again, if you want to code along, this could be a nice exercise. So look at the update head graphic and try to figure out the logic for the tail. But okay, pause the video now if you want to code along and I'm going to continue myself in a couple of seconds.
Okay, welcome back. Let's try to do it together now. So I want to create a new method, dev update tail graphics. And just to save me some writing, I'm going to copy the entire line for the head and just paste it in here. And now it's going to be tail relation. And now we don't want to look at the second and the first element. Instead, we want to look at the last element and the element that comes before the last one. So we know our last one is minus one and then the one before is minus two. So this one is quite easy to start. And then I have to change all of the tail relation L if statements and also change all of this to tail. Might have benefited from naming my variables better, but uh, never mind. Okay, here we go. So this would actually almost work. So let me try. And I forgot one equal sign. Let's try it again now. There we go. And there we go. We have a nicely functioning tail. Cool. So that was surprisingly easy, actually. So the same logic that we used for the head, we can use for the tail. So now we have covered the tail. With that, we can start working on the actual body or the rest of the body. And this is all going to end up in an else statement. And in here, it is starting to become important to figure out what is the next and the previous block. So I want to know what is my previous block and what is my next block. And we know the block we're on right now, that's just block. So in here, the index again is going to be incredibly useful because all we have to do is self dot body and then index plus one minus block. And then for the next block, we have to do the same thing except we subtract index minus one. So just to explain what happens here, we are indexing from self dot body and index is going to be our current element. And then we either add one or subtract one to get the next or the previous block, which I think is quite straightforward. And then from that, we are going to subtract our current block to get the relation between the two. And this is going to result in a new vector that again can point in one of four directions. And from that, we can tell what kind of block we need. And now we can start with the horizontal or vertical body parts. So these are going to be body parts that either are entirely horizontal or entirely vertical. So I don't go around the corner at all. And this is really easy to get because all we have to check is if previous block and next block have the same X or Y coordinates. Because if that is the case, the block between these two blocks has to be either horizontal or vertical, depending on if we look at X or Y. So let's implement this with another if statement. And what I want to know is if previous block dot x is equal to next block dot x. And if both of these have the same x coordinate, we know it's going to be a vertical block. So we can use screen dot blit, and this is going to be self dot vertical, and then block rect. And let's try this. Oh, right. As a typo, I have to get rid of yeah, let's get rid of it entirely because it's just going to cause errors otherwise. So now some parts of our snake we don't draw, but um, I think that illustrates it even better what is missing. So now we can see our snake is working when we're going up and down. But if we're going left or right or around the corner, things are missing. But otherwise, our snake is still working quite nicely. So we are making quite decent progress. Looks actually quite funny, but okay. Now I want to copy this entire if statement. And now I just have to check the Y parts. And if those are identical, we know our block is horizontal. And I want to make this an if statement. So let's try this one now. And we can see we have horizontal and a vertical body part for our snake. We don't have any corners, but that's going to come next. Besides that, everything seems to be working quite nicely. So we are making some decent progress. So now we come to the most complicated part, where we have to look at the corners of our snake. And all of this is going to be inside of another else statement. 
And let me explain the logic here to get this done. And I think the best way to explain this is by using an example. So let's say we want to create a corner where we go left and then up, or where we go down and right. It's going to be the same corner. And really all we have to do is to check the X and the Y position of our previous and next block. And we have the information to achieve all of this. But you probably have to look over this a couple of times. It is a little bit confusing. But okay, here we are back in our code. And what I want to do is screen.blit. And I want to blit self.bodytl. So this is top left. So the corner is going up and left. And again, we need our block rect. So we are now, so we now have to figure out when to trigger this corner. So all of this goes inside of an if statement, a pretty long if statement actually. So we want to check if previous block dot x is equal to minus one and next block dot y is also equal to minus one. Or we could start from the other way, where our previous block dot y is equal to minus one and next block dot x is equal to minus one. And let's try this one. So top left, there you can see it, we have one corner. And we can also go bottom right, and this would still be working. Bottom left, I mean, sorry. And there we go, we have our first corner. And now all we have to do is to copy this if statement a couple of times and change our attributes. And of course the image we're actually blitting. So I would have bottom left, I would have top right, and then the remaining one would be bottom right. And the coordinates would be previous block x minus one, and next block should be one. And then previous block would be one for y, and the x would be minus one. Then we have for top right, the previous block x would be one, and next block y would be minus one. Or alternatively, we would have the y part would be minus one, and next block would just be one. And for the final one, we would have one and one, and same for the other way around as well. Okay, and those are all the bits. Let's actually try this together. And this looks pretty good. Okay, cool. So this is actually drawing graphics quite efficiently. And works even if we go really close to each other and looks quite clean. Okay, and all of this is probably quite confusing. And honestly, when I figured this out, I went by trial and error. Thinking about all of this gave me a headache. So if this doesn't make full sense, don't worry about it. it. It really is kind of annoying to think about. But really, all we are doing is we look at our previous block and our next block and how they relate to our current block. And from that, we can tell what kind of corner we need. But granted, it does get quite confusing. But okay, with all of that one done, I can get rid of the comments. And we have our basic snake. And we created an elif statement that covers basically an entire page. Cool. Always feels good. So now I can close drawing snake and not worry about this for a while. And for the next part, I want to update the grass so it starts to look a little bit nicer. And let's actually jump right in. I think that's going to be the easiest way to approach this. So here we are back in our code. And in our class main, I want to create a new method that I call define draw grass. And this one, well, it draws the grass. So we have a checkerboard style grass pattern on our field to make it look a bit more interesting. And to achieve this kind of effect, all we really have to do is cycle through each of the line and draw a slightly darker green rectangle if we have an odd or an even number. So to start this off, I'm going to create, just to save me some writing later on, a grass color variable. And this is just going to be an RGB tuple with 167, 209, and 61. So this is a dark greenish color. 
And now we have to cycle through every single cell on our field and either draw a darker rectangle or not draw a darker rectangle. And to start this one off simple, let me just start with the first line. This one is going to make it quite a bit easier. So I want to start with four column in range cell number. So this would cover the horizontal axis of our entire field. And for each of those, I want to create a new grass rectangle. And this is just going to be a Pygame rect object. And here we need an X, a Y, a width, and a height, just as we have always used. And width and height, again, is just going to be cell size, the one we have always used. I almost regret not naming this with a shorter name, but okay. Now we need two more pieces of information. The first one is Y. And for now, this is just going to be zero because we want to work with the first row, but we are going to change this later on. So now we are going to need our X coordinate. And we could just start with this call. So our column multiplied by cell size. So this would give us a rectangle. And now we can just draw it with pygame.draw.rect. And I think by now you should know it. So this is screen, the surface we want to draw on, then the color, this one we already predefined, and then our grass rect. So this right now would cover the entire first line of our field. And let's actually illustrate this. So when we come to draw elements, below all the other elements, I want self.draw grass. And let's try this. And you can see the very first line of our field is slightly darker. So we do manage to draw at least a little bit. But, well, it's not great yet. So we have to make some more changes. And the first change I want to do is that I only want to draw every second field, not every field. And you could approach this in two different ways. You could either draw all the fields that start with an even number or all the fields that start with an odd number. Which one you go for doesn't really matter. But really, all this is, is if call mod2 gets us a zero, only then do we want to draw all of this. And let's try this. And now we can see we have only every second field working for this. So this is already working quite nicely. So now we have to do this thing for every second line in our field. So what I want to do is to go for row in range cell number. So we go for every single row in our field. And now we are going to do this operation again, except for the row, not for the column. So we want to only draw this kind of row if the row starts on an even number. So if row divided by two is equal to zero. And if I run this, oh, forgot the if statement. So if row, and I have to indent everything as well. Let's try it now. Ah, and this doesn't work right now because we are still starting at position zero. So we have to make an update to this one. So right now we are drawing this multiple times, but we always start at position zero. So they're all drawn on top of each other. But all we have to replace it with is our row multiplied by our cell size. And let's try this one now. And there we go. This is starting to look much nicer. And now we have at least every second row working properly. And everything still works. Okay. So now all we have to do is if this is not the case. So we go for an else statement. Then we want to do this entire thing again. And let me copy it properly. Except now we want to check all the odd fields. And this is working. So this is looking at least a bit more interesting. And there really isn't all that much left to go for for a proper game. The two more things I want to add is a score and a sound effect. And let's start with the score. And to get a score, we need some text. And text in Pygame needs a couple of steps to work. So let's talk through them. Ultimately, there are three steps we have to be aware of. Number one is that we have to create a font object. 
And this one is going to determine what our text looks like and how large it is. Then we have to use this font to render some text. And this is actually creating some text. So for all practical purposes, we are writing something. And this text is going to end up on a new surface, exactly like the pictures we have imported so far. And then for the final step, we have to blit the image on our actual game screen. And that is pretty much it. So let's start creating the basic score. And once we have that, we can make it look nicer. So here we are back in the game code. And the first thing I want to do in our main setup part, I want to create a new font. And I call this game font. And to create a font, we need pygame.font.font. And do make sure the second font has to start with an uppercase letter. This one is important. And in here, we need two pieces of information. The first one is the font we want to use, and then font size. Font size is the easier part. This one is just an integer. I went with 25. And for the font, we could just go with none, and then we get a default font for Pygame. But I want to import a font. And for that, I need to give the name of the font I want to use. And this has to be a TTF file that I downloaded earlier. And you can get a TTF file really easily from websites like dafont.com, for example. And there are plenty of free ones, just check it out. But in my case, the file is located in a folder called font. And the name of the file is poetson one regulardtf And with that, we have imported a font. So our text is going to look like whatever this font looks like. And the size is going to be 25. So these are the two basic things we have to start with. And now in our main class, I want to create a new method. And let me minimize all the other methods I have so far, just to make it a bit easier to see what's going on. There really is quite a bit of stuff going on by now. I want to create a new method that is called draw score. Does not need any parameters. And in here, we have to create our score. And there are quite a few bits of information we first need to draw all of this. The first one is the actual score text. So we have to figure out what is our actual score and put this into a text. And the basic logic I went with is that the length of our self.snake.body is going to be our score. So the longer our snake is, the higher of a score we get. So this will be the basic part that determines our score. But we are starting with three blocks inside of our snake. So I have to reduce this by three so that we start with zero. But then all of this has to be a string so that we can display it easier. So I put it in the str method. That works very similar compared to the int method, except now it turns any kind of value inside of this into a string instead of an integer. And with that, we are getting our basic score. So this is a good way to start. And with that, I can create the actual score. And this would be a score surface, so let me write it properly. And to create this, we first need our game font. So what we created down here. And we want to render it. And in here, we need three pieces of information. The first one is the text. Then if you want to anti-alias it, and then we need a color. And let me talk through them step by step. The first one for our text is just going to be our score text. So what we created up here. And for the color, I am just going to go with an RGB tuple again, which this time is 56, 74, and 12, which is a fairly dark color that has slightly more green than the other values. Finally, we need the anti-alias text. And this one either has to be true or false. And anti-aliasing just means we make the text a bit smoother. And unless you're working with pixel art or you work on a really slow computer, this is usually best left for true. And it makes our text look a bit nicer. But ultimately, this really isn't going to make that much of a difference, especially for a simple game like ours. So I just leave it with true. But all right, now we have a text surface that we just have to put on the screen. So this is going to go with screen.blit. And now we do have a score surface. But now we need to get a position of this text. And here we have to determine where we want to put it on our screen. And I want to put it in the bottom right-ish of our game. And to get it there, I'm going to add a few more variables just to make it easier to read. So I create a score x variable that is again going to be an integer of cell size times cell number. So this would be the right end of the screen. And from that, I want to remove a couple of pixels. 
So I removed 60 from there, meaning that we go all the way to the right of the screen and then go a bit further to the left. So we are in the right end of the screen. And then I'm going to do the same thing for Y. That again, I want to go all the way down to the bottom of the screen, but now I want to go a bit up again. So let's make this a bit less, 240. And from these two bits of information, we can create a score rectangle. And here, I want to get our score surface and get the rectangle around it. So when we create this score surface with some text, it has some dimensions. And with getRect, we can access all of them. And even better, we can immediately place this rectangle somewhere on the screen. And right now, I'm placing the center. And what we pass in here is an X and a Y position where we want to place it. And for this, we can use these two bits of information. So this would be our score X and score Y. And now that we have a rectangle, we can just place this into the position for our screen.blit. And this is pretty much all we need for the score. So now when we come to draw elements, I want also to draw a score. So self.draw score. And let's see if this is working. And it is not because I made a typo. This should be poet sen one. So now let's try this again. And there we go. In the bottom right of our screen, we can see a number. And every time we pick up an apple, this one goes up. And let's try one more. And this seems to be working quite well. Cool. So with this bit of code, we get our score. But by itself, the score looks a bit bland. So I want to add two things to it. Number one, I want to add an apple to the left of it. And number two, below the score, I want to add a plain rectangle so that it stands out a bit more from the background. And both of these are quite easy to get. So let's add them now. So what we ultimately want to achieve is screen.blit again. And this time we want to use our apple again, the one we imported down here. And then again, we need a position for the apple. So we have to write some code for this position. And the position is supposed to be that this apple is slightly to the left of our score. So we have to use our current existing score and place the apple to the right of it, which fortunately we can do quite easily. And I think to make our code a bit easier, I'm going to put the two screen blitz together and then all the setup part goes into one big chunk of code. That should make it a bit easier to see. Okay, what I want to do is apple rect to get the position. And this is going to be our apple and get rect again. And for this rectangle, we don't want to place the center. Instead, we want to place the mid right. And where the mid right is supposed to be is on the left of this apple here. So for the X, I want score rect dot left. And for the Y, I want score rect dot center Y. And that's basically all we needed. So now when we blit the apple, we need apple and apple rect. And let's try. And there we go. We have an apple next to our score. And let me explain what happens here. So on the score, we place the center of our rectangle on these positions that are roughly in the bottom right of the screen. But when we create our apple rectangle, we take the mid right point of this rectangle, we place it on the left of our score rectangle and the Y position is going to be the middle of the score rect. So what we effectively do is that we place the apple rect on the same height as the score rect and the X position is going to be slightly to the left. And with that, we have the two basic points. The only thing left to do is to create a slight background so that both of these stand out a bit more. Although I think by itself you could even leave it like that. But um, it's up to you. Doesn't look too bad right now. So I want to create a BG rectangle for the background. And this is going to be a pygame.rect object. And in here we need an X position, a Y position, a width and a height. So let's go through all of these step by step. So our rectangle is supposed to start at the top left of our apple. And these are points we can get very easily. So I want apple rect dot left and for the Y apple rect dot top. So that our background starts at the top left of our apple. And the height is the next easy ish part because all we want is the apple rect dot height. 
so that our rectangle starts at the top left of the apple and takes the entire height of the apple. For the simple reason that the apple is larger than the text. So if we cover the entire apple, we also cover the text as well. So now we need the width. And for the width, we want to cover both the apple and the text. So this is going to be our apple rect dot width plus score rect dot width. And this should cover the entire rectangle. So once we have that, I want to use pygame.draw.rect, draw on the screen. The color I want to go with is 164, 209, and 61, so the dark grass color. And I want to draw our BG rectangle. And let's try this. So if you look very closely, you can see it, especially if I go below it. There, you can definitely see it. So this is working, but it's very hard to see. So what I am going to do is to draw a frame around this box. And drawing a frame around the box is very easy to do in Pygame. So let me copy the first rectangle. And all we have to do to draw a frame around it is to add another argument. So in my case, this would be two. But the problem here right now would be that we have a rectangle with one color and the frame around it has the same color. So we couldn't really see the frame. And to fix that, I'm just going to copy the text color and let's try this now. So now this looks much better. And now you can see that the box is a little bit too narrow. So that the number is too far to the right and it touches the frame, which doesn't look good. So we have to make it slightly larger. This is the width argument. And all I want to do is to make this slightly larger. So I'm going to add plus, let's try six. And let's try it now. And yeah, this looks much better. Now it's roughly in the middle. And there we go. This is working pretty well. So with that part covered, we have a score. And now we can work on adding some sounds to our game. And adding sound in Pygame is actually super easy. But there's one thing you do have to be aware of that is a little bit annoying. But I think it's best to jump right into our code and let's add the sound and then we can talk about the problems with sound in Pygame. And I only want to add a single sound, that when our snake collides with a fruit, then we want to play a crunchy sound. And you could add more sounds, like a background music or game over sound, but if you can get one sound, you can get all of them. And I don't want to overcomplicate things. So we are just going to stick with a single sound. And let's do all of this. So here we are back in our code. And I want to import our sound to our snake, because that's the only place where we're actually going to need it. So right in the init method that gets really extensive by now, I want to add a new attribute that I call crunch sound. And to import a sound, we need pygame.mixer.sound. And here again, this sound has to start with an uppercase letter. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And now we need the file name. And in my case, I have a folder called sound. And in there, there's a file called crunch.wav. And with that, we have imported a sound. So that's the first step we need. And then for the snake, I want to create a new method. And let me minimize all of the other methods. So this is a bit easier to see what we are doing. Okay, so all the way down in this method, I want to create a new method that's called play branch sound. And this only needs a single line of code. We want self.crunchsound.play. And so now, whenever we execute this method, we are going to play the crunch sound. And let me close the entire thing again. And now in our main class, when we get to check collision, we also want to play this sound. So self.snake.playcrunchsound. And let's actually try this. So this seems to be working, but the problem we have right now is that the sound has a slight delay. So that it doesn't play right when we eat the fruit, instead it plays about half a second later, which can be really weird. The reason is that Pygame first buffers a sound before it plays it, and this creates a short delay between the code being triggered and the sound playing. But we can fix that quite easily. So let me close our main class, and what we have to do 
is work with pygame.init, at least a tiny bit. And in pygame.init, there's a method called mixer. And mixer is responsible for all the sounds. And what we want to do is pygame.mixer.freeInit. And in here, there are quite a few arguments you could pass into it. And it can get quite technical. But I have found four numbers that work really well. So these four give you a good sound and play the sound immediately. But if you want to know more about sound in Pygame, there's a documentation that gives you a lot more detail. So I would just copy the numbers and don't worry too much about it. But let's try it with these numbers. And we are getting a sound immediately. So this is now working. And with that, we are nearly done. There's one more thing I do want to cover though that I forgot to check earlier. That, let me go back to our main. When we check collisions and we create a new fruit on the field, there is a very small chance that our fruit lands on the body of our snake, which would be very confusing. So we have to add a little bit of extra code here that if the fruit is on the rest of the body of the snake, we want to randomize it again. So really all that we want to do is for block in self.snake.body. And here we don't want to check for the head. So this would be from one all the way to the end with index zero being the head and everything else being the body. And this is what we want to check. And really what we want to check is if block is equal to self.fruit dot pos and if that is the case we just want self dot root dot randomize so really all that is happening here is that we are checking every single block of our self dot snake dot body and check if it happens to be on the same position as the fruit and if that happens we want to put the fruit in a different place and that way we ensure that our fruit is never on top of the snake body and this is quite difficult to show because, well, it depends on a lot of random chance. And ideally, it's something we want to avoid happening. But with all of that covered, we have created a pretty nice snake game. And there's one final thing I do want to change. That whenever we die, the game just ends. Which isn't ideal. And really, all I want to do is that if our player fails, I want to put the snake back in the default position. So we don't really have a game over menu, instead we just restart the game immediately. But you could be adding all the menus you wanted, but I think in this case it doesn't really make sense. But let's actually implement this. So we have to go to our game over and see what happens in here. Right now we are just ending the game, which well isn't great. Instead I want to get self.snake.reset. So this method doesn't exist right now, so we have to create it. And let's close our main class and go back to the snake. And here we really start to have quite a bit of stuff in there. But let's add one more. It's going to be the final one. And I called this reset. And what is supposed to happen in here is that we take our initial self.body and just recreate the basic points. So really we just take our self dot body where we started. And that is literally all we have to do. And we don't even have to update the score because the score just checks how long this list is. So we don't really have to do anything. So let me try this now. And our game still starts. The score also works. And now let me fail. And we move back to the starting position. So this is quite well. Let's try it again. And yeah, it works quite well. So most of the game is done. There's one last thing that is a little bit annoying. And let me illustrate this. So right now our direction is downwards and we start again, our snake goes downwards again. So when we restart the game, we also have to change the starting direction. So all we have to do is go back all the way to the top and change this value. And actually all we have to do is to change this to zero and zero. And then let me copy the entire line and further down for the reset method. I also want to set the direction back to zero and zero when we reset the snake. And let's try this. 
So if I don't press anything, the snake isn't moving. If I press something, we are starting to move. And I can pick up a couple of apples. The score is working. If I go game over, our snake isn't moving again. And only if I start pressing a button, it is starting to work. So all of this is working really well. And well, that is it for the entire game. 